This video is sponsored by KiwiCo. Now, while Saturn is my favorite planet by far, Jupiter comes in at a very close second. I mean, just look at it. These images have been sent back by NASA's Juno probe. It's currently in orbit around Jupiter. And while they're absolutely glorious to look at, we can also do some amazing science with them. So last year in 2020, the Juno mission team announced they'd found evidence for something completely unexpected in Jupiter's atmosphere, hail. Now I'm not talking about hailstones like what we see on Earth. These are giant mush balls. So one of Juno's science goals was to better understand Jupiter's atmosphere. Now Jupiter is a gas giant planet, so we're not talking about like a thin layer of protective atmosphere over a solid surface like we have on Earth or Mars, but a giant swirling maelstrom of activity that makes up like the entire planet. So how does this work? What is its weather like and how will it change over time? So it's a pretty big task and there's still a lot that we don't understand, like in most areas of science, right? There's more that we don't know than we do know. But what we do know is that Jupiter's atmosphere is made of mostly hydrogen and helium. And that's because when we take the light from Jupiter and we sort of split it into its component wavelengths or its component colors, we make a trace of how much light we get at each wavelength. We see that we're missing some colors or wavelengths where hydrogen and helium in the atmosphere have absorbed those specific wavelengths. Kind of like a fingerprint to tell us which elements and molecules are there. So we can also tell that some trace amounts of methane and ammonia and water as well in Jupiter's atmosphere by the same technique. And all of that mixes together to give us Jupiter's gas giant atmosphere that also has things like weather and clouds just like we see on Earth because the same processes that cause our weather on Earth also cause the weather on Jupiter. Like gas rising from where it's hotter further down in the atmosphere to colder regions at the top of the atmosphere and falling down in this cycle. So for example, the incredibly famous red spot on Jupiter, which has been raging for hundreds of years that we know of at least. And it's essentially a giant hurricane bigger than the entire Earth. Plus we've got all these stripy bands of clouds on Jupiter as well that circle the planet. All these clouds we think are made of this mix of mostly ammonia, but some water too. And then the colors are given by the different elements that might be in excess there. So things like sulfur or phosphorus and carbon. But what happens when you have clouds and storms? Well, you get lightning on Jupiter. And that's because there is water in these clouds on Jupiter. You need water to actually create lightning. So water is H2O, right? It's two atoms of hydrogen with one atom of oxygen. And the two atoms of hydrogen share their negatively charged electrons with the oxygen in order to bond together. But what that means is it causes a little bit of a charge gradient. It means that the hydrogen side of the molecule is a little bit more positively charged and the oxygen side of the molecule is a bit more negatively charged. So when you've got gas molecules rising and falling in all of these big turbulent clouds and bumping together, you create static, which when it gets too big, discharges in a flash of lightning. Now we've known there was lightning on Jupiter since 1979, when the Voyager probes first spotted it, and it's been seen again over the years by the Galileo orbiter around Jupiter and Cassini on its way to Saturn as well. Now, every time we've spotted lightning on Jupiter, we've seen it as these big bright spots of light on the top of clouds. And how big that area of light is that you see can actually tell you where in the atmosphere that lightning actually originated. So if the lightning originated much deeper down into the atmosphere, that means the light can spread out more on its way up to escaping at the top of the atmosphere when we then see it. But of course, if it happens higher up, it doesn't spread out as much. And so the area that you see is much more concentrated. So because the lightning that we saw was so big, we thought the lightning was happening very deep down in Jupiter's atmosphere. And that made sense to us as well, because we know that here on Earth, to generate lightning in a cloud, you need water in all of gas, liquid, and solid form. So as a vapor, as like liquid rain, and as ice. And that's to have the right conditions to be able to generate enough static to be able to even generate lightning. 
So we figured from modeling Jupiter's atmosphere, we worked out that at about 65 kilometers down, you'd have a temperature about zero degrees Celsius, and you'd have the pressure that would be right to give you water in gas, liquid, and solid form, and therefore you'd be able to produce this lightning that was then seen at the very tops of the clouds. But recent observations by Juno have changed all that. The cameras on Juno are so good that they can see much greater detail. And they're able to resolve even the smallest features on Jupiter, which means that you can much more accurately measure how big of an area those lightning flashes actually cover and therefore more accurately work out where they're coming from. Unlike on previous missions where the cameras weren't so good and those lightning flashes would probably get smeared out over a much larger area because the camera couldn't pick out that kind of detail. And so in this work that was published last year by Becker and collaborators on the Juno mission, they found that some of the detected lightning was coming from the very top of the atmosphere. That's really weird because at the very top of the atmosphere, it would be incredibly cold, the pressure would be very low, and you wouldn't get water in a liquid form at all. So you wouldn't have a cloud that contained water in solid, liquid, and gas so that you could generate enough static and actually produce lightning. And yet there we are observing lightning happening at the very top of the clouds. So what is going on in Jupiter's atmosphere? Well, another study was published at the same time, this one by Gio and collaborators, and it explained how the lightning was created and another unexplained phenomenon seen by Juno by observing Jupiter with microwaves. That unexplained phenomenon is that ammonia isn't very well mixed in the atmosphere of Jupiter, unlike the methane and the water that we see. There are areas where it's very highly concentrated and areas where it's very severely depleted. Now, the idea that people had come up with to explain this is that if ammonia and water were mixing inside clouds to give you this sort of liquid rain that was ammonia and water mixed, that would then fall through the atmosphere and essentially the water would drag the ammonia down with it, and therefore you would then not be able to detect the ammonia using the microwaves anymore. But then people pointed out that, that rain wouldn't actually fall far enough in Jupiter's atmosphere before it turned back into a vapor, for example, to explain how deep they'd actually seen this ammonia depletion down to in Jupiter's atmosphere. Now, it was the discovery that lightning was happening really high up in Jupiter's atmosphere that gave the Juno team the last piece of the puzzle. Now, for lightning to be happening that high up in Jupiter's atmosphere, there has to be liquid water present. Now, we know the clouds can kick up a load of ice crystals sort of as it gets stormier, and those ice crystals will remain as ice because the temperature is so cold up there, unless they encounter some ammonia, which can act as like an antifreeze melting the ice crystals and once again forming this ammonia water liquid mix which can then along with the ice generate enough static to generate lightning. But as that ammonia water mix then falls through the atmosphere where the pressure increases it then starts to freeze and forms hail. It can then snowball as it falls gathering an ever thicker layer of ice around this ammonia water core. And Guio and collaborators dubbed these slushy ammonia water hail mush balls. And it's these mush balls that we think are responsible now for this uneven mixing of ammonia in Jupiter's atmosphere. The ammonia gets trapped in the core of that mush ball, which is so heavy, it falls much deeper into Jupiter's atmosphere, where of course, eventually it gets a lot warmer, the ice around the outside is melted, and eventually you free the ammonia that's trapped in there because it turns back into vapor. And you end up with a much higher concentration of ammonia, much deeper in the atmosphere with everything above it depleted. Now, of course, eventually an updraft will probably rise that ammonia back to the very top of the atmosphere in sort of this never-ending cycle and set the whole process of mushball creation going again. Now, Guillaume and collaborators estimated that these mushballs could grow to 10 centimeters wide. Hail that size is very rare on Earth, but it has been seen before. The biggest hailstone ever recorded fell in Virginia in the USA in 2010, and it was 20 centimeters wide. 20 centimeters! That's crazy! So I guess it really makes these 10 centimeter mush balls on Jupiter 
seem not that weird anymore. And I think that's what I love about the Juno mission is that it's really revealed that the processes that, you know, govern our everyday weather here on Earth from updrafts and downdrafts and storms and lightning and hail are also all raging away in that beautiful, swirling, gas giant atmosphere of Jupiter. Before we get to the bloopers, I just want to take a minute to thank this week's video sponsor, KiwiCo. KiwiCo creates really cool hands-on projects and toys that are designed to expose kids to all kinds of science and maths content. They come in these monthly subscription crates that are tailored to specific age groups and each one is designed by experts and tested by kids. I get asked so often by parents, like, what can they do to nurture their kids' love of science? And personally, I think the Kiwi Co crates are a perfect way to do that. They help develop kids' problem-solving skills and their creativity in a fun way. Plus, each crate comes with these fab magazines, chock full of really cool science. Here I'm building their Tinker Crate for ages nine plus, emphasis on the plus there, because it was great fun. I had all the supplies I needed and I built a walking robot. How cool is that? So if there's a little kid or a big kid in your life that you think will enjoy a monthly science subscription crate, then head to kiwico.com forward slash drbecky50. That's D-R-B-E-C-K-Y-5-0. Or you can click on the link in the description and that'll get you 50% off your first month of any subscription crate. So thank you so much to Kiwico for sponsoring this video. And now roll those bloopers. So we can also tell that there's some trace amounts of methane and pneumonia and, sounds like I said pneumonia, and the hydrogen atoms share their negative electrons in order to bond together with the hydrogen. With the hydrogen, the hydrogen bonds with the hydrogen. On this side of the molecule, and you have, ugh, words Becky today, molecule, should be able to answer that. I've got hair in my eye. They call them mush balls. Mush balls, mush balls, city limits. <laughs> 